What is digital identity today? And what are the problems with it right now? Today, people see digital identity as a digital version of your passport. I see it as much, much more than that. I see it as a digital me. So it's a digital representation of me and who I am. So obviously to access certain services and to go into places or buy certain things, I need to prove something about myself. And that's where digital identity comes in. It's, it gives me the ability to prove something about myself either in a Web3 world, a Web2 world, or in real world. And that's what I see sort of digital identity as. And there are sort of some very firm definitions of what digital identity or DI is under sort of W3C standards. But I, I personally see that as a lot more than that. I see it as a digital need and something that allows me to do something and make it easier for me to access certain things or prove something about myself in the real world or the virtual world. Right. So it's more broad to identity in general of yeah. things like your driver's license or your passport and using those things the way you would use them in the real world. But right now they're physical and you think about them more in a digital way. Yeah, exactly. And I also sort of feel that we're going on to your next question where it's broken at the moment is we're forced to share everything about ourselves to do small things. Mm -hmm. And a very good example of that is here in Australia where I am, if I'm sort of young, I go to 7-Eleven to buy some cigarettes or some alcohol or something like that. I have to show them my ID. And in Australia, your ID contains your full name, your date of birth, your driver's license number, your home address. It contains everything about you. So I'm handing this card over to someone that I don't know, that I don't trust, that they can look at it and get all this information about me just to prove that I'm over 18 to be able to buy that alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the same goes to going into clubs and things like that. Or when I'm signing up for a crypto exchange service or something like that, and all they want to know is that I'm not in a certain jurisdiction, that I'm allowed to trade and things like that. But I'm doing a selfie, I'm photographing two forms of ID, like I'm doing all this stuff and just giving away my information. With Apple, I can sort of store all my stuff in my Apple wallet and then they have all my information. <laughs> like. There's just this oversharing of information. It's biting us already. There's some major hacks in Australia with the Optus hack and the Medibank hack where people's passport information, passport numbers, tax file numbers, like all this information has basically been leaked. Mm -hmm. And those companies had no right to hold all of that information. They had to, but they had no right to because they didn't need all of that information. Our mission is really to... A, provide this frictionless access to goods and services, but also whilst maintaining this trust and high level of security and actually ownership and control of your information. It's something that I believe that we're solving. Give us an example of how it would be different and maybe use the example of a young Aussie going to get cigarettes from a convenience store. How could it be different with what so, we're so or with sharing? That's a really good example. So if an organization trusted the technology that was developed, right? I could go into this 7-Eleven store, scan a QR code with my phone, and it basically is green light. This person is over 18. I can buy it and take it away. Or maybe I use biometrics like a thumbprint or something like that. So we use like a zero knowledge type of system to be able to prove that I'm over 18 because that's the only question that they're asking. Are you over 18? So I should be able to answer yes and prove that I am through the technology, through this trust that's created with the technology without sharing any information about myself. I don't even need to share my date of birth. I just need to confirm that I'm over 18 because there's trust in this verified identity that's been created. That's a really good extreme example of it. Other examples are a lot of sort of these DeFi lending contracts and things like that. Institutions cannot interact with them because of the counterparty risk associated with them not knowing who they're lending mm -hmm. or borrowing from. We could effectively create, say, a soulbound token that says two things. One, I'm allowed to trade because I'm over 18, or maybe there's an age restriction, or B, I'm not in a sanctioned country. And that allows me to interact with that DeFi platform. So then institutions can suddenly interact with it because they know that everyone that's interacting with it is not from those sanctioned countries. That sort of goes from one physical thing at a 7-Eleven to Web3, and there's everything in between. It's about sharing the minimum amount of data that allows you to gain access to the service you want to access.